Hi, welcome back to the channel. Uh, as you can see, this week I'm back in the office and I haven't really managed to get out this week at all. I've been so busy doing other things, uh, planning for quite a big event uh, this week on Saturday, actually. And that is my wedding. Yes, I'm getting married. I'm going to be marrying Kat, who quite often helps me with these videos. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to that. It's going to be a very exciting day. And by the time you watch this, I will be a very happy man, a very happily married man. So yeah, so uh, wish me luck for that. And uh, yeah, let's see how it goes. So that means I haven't been out and I've been in here. So I'm going to talk about one of the trips that I did, which was uh, not so long ago. And um, it wasn't really a landscape photography trip. I, I love landscape photography. It's it's amazing. For me, it's very cathartic. I can get out into the, the outdoors without a worry and relax and just take in the the landscape, nature, the wilderness. And it's it's incredibly important to me to do that. But one of the things that I do outside of landscapes is I do a lot of travel photography. But my travel photography is generally to very extreme and remote locations. So it wasn't that long ago I planned a trip. It actually took a year to plan this trip, but it was a trip to the Arctic and uh, 200 miles inside the Arctic uh, to be exact. And when I was there, I lived with reindeer herders and they were traditional reindeer herders. They, they have this uh, very old culture, very traditional. They just wear reindeer furs and there's no modernity in their life at all it was absolutely incredible so what i'd like to do is just talk about that experience and show you some of the images uh, that i took while i was there I mean, first of all it took a year to plan the area that i went to was uh, in russia so it's russian arctic uh, so it's controlled by russia and they and the reindeer herders are the nenets reindeer herders and they're an incredible people and there's a lot of them in Russia. They have their own autonomous region in the northern part of Russia. Uh, and a lot of them have settled. So nearly 50,000 of them have settled. They were forced to settle during the Soviet times. And they were forced to abandon their own language and take on Russian. But there was a very small element of those Nenets that clung on to the traditional way of life and the traditional culture and their own language. And it was those people that I wanted to go and visit. Now, I say it took a year to plan. I had to apply for lots of permissions, including permission from the FSB, which is the old KGB. And once I got through that bureaucracy, I then had to get there. And from the UK, that was one hell of a trek. So it was two flights, a flight from here to Moscow, and then from Moscow to a city called Salikhard, which is the only city on the Arctic Circle. And... It was in Salikard, it was like minus 30. So that was a real taste of, of what was to come. Uh, and then from Salikard, we had to book ourselves onto this uh, huge vehicle called a Trekkel, which is a big six-wheeled beast. You know, I thought it was going to be a couple of hours to get to where we were going. No, it was eight hours. An eight-hour trip in the back of this vehicle. And it was on a frozen river all the way. So it felt like being the back of a, a, a tumble dryer. So that took us to a village called Yarsail, which is uh, quite way up in Russia, inside the Arctic Circle. And it was from there that we then had to go find the reindeer herders. So that was another four hour trek in a box sled being pulled by uh, a snowmobile. And it was incredibly cold, everything froze, and we were out for four hours and I had no idea if we were gonna find them or not. And then, all of a sudden this incredible sight just opened up in front of me and I could see these thousands of reindeer coming towards me and people with all this fur on them and big sticks on sledges you know controlling the reindeer it was incredible I was completely overwhelmed by that sight and I tried to pick my camera up and and record what I could see in front of me but I was overwhelmed I had no idea if my settings were right I, there was just so much going on it was it was incredible it was exhilarating it was just it was fascinating so we stopped and they stopped and we introduced ourselves and we expressed our wish that we wanted to live with them and they laughed at first uh, they had 
no idea why they couldn't comprehend why we wanted to live with them uh, to them it was just like why you know go somewhere sunny go somewhere warm why do you want to live here and then the elder said something to me that worried me just a little bit he said you're going to die within a day wearing those clothes now don't get me wrong i wasn't wearing jeans and a t-shirt i was in you know full-on arctic level expedition clothing and it shocked me in a way uh, but I understood where he was coming from because these are traditional reindeer herders. Everything they wear pretty much comes from the reindeer. Reindeer skins, reindeer furs, everything apart from a, a cloth outer. And if that's what you're used to and that's what you've lived with all your life and generations have lived with that and that reindeer provides that for you and, and it keeps you warm and dry, then yes, when you see somebody dressed as I was, you probably think that isn't sufficient because it's all synthetic and modern clothing. So I kind of understood that. Anyway, we settled with them. They stopped for the night. They put up their tents and they live in these tents. Uh, they're like um, uh, teepees. Uh, they're called chums. And they put it up very, really quickly. I mean, it went up in like 20 minutes. I tried to help, but they just told me to stay out of the way. I think I was more of a hindrance than an actual help. And I, I kind of get that, you know, in those extreme environments, they everybody in that family knew exactly what they had to do they knew exactly what their job was you cannot mess around uh your life depends on it you have to get it done quickly without argument and everything slots into place and yeah me trying to chip in and be helpful it was just a hindrance it was like no stand over there we'll do this so i kind of understood that uh and it was quite funny anyway we settled in and i was so surprised to to get inside this chum it was incredibly warm inside they had this heater in the middle which was uh fueled by fire and reindeer dung and that just heated the chum up beautifully it was amazing uh but it also provided heat for cooking so they cooked on there as well anyway the time came where i'd had drunk enough tea and water and i i really needed to go to the toilet i needed a wee and as i was going out i put my clothes back on and the elder shouted after me, take the stick, make sure you take the stick. And there was a stick just sticking in the snow by the door. And I, I turned around and said, what do I need the stick for? He went, you'll see, just take the stick. So I took the stick, I went outside, I walked a suitable distance away from the chum, dreading the fact I would have to expose myself to uh, nearly minus 40 degrees. I reluctantly undid my trousers and the minute I started to have a wee, I was literally charged at by reindeer. And it became very clear what that stick was for. That stick was to beat back the reindeer. There is something in human uh, wee that they love, whether it's the salt or, or whatever it was, I don't know. But they, they literally came right up. It was very intrusive. And they were trying to drink the wee as I was producing it. And that's what the stick was for. So I chuckled to myself as I was trying to bat these reindeer back. It's just incredible. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, who would have thought? And when I went back inside, there was that knowing look from the elder. You know, I now knew what the stick was for. Uh, and he'd, he'd told me that. It was just hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. It's an incredible experience. And living in that chum and seeing the closeness of the family and the laughs that they had without radio, without television, without the internet, without mobile phones. It was incredible, you know, very simple life, very harsh life, living in those temperatures. You know, it was minus 40 when I was there. It, it can get down to minus 15, minus 60 when the wind picks up across that tundra. And yet they were happy. They were happy with what they had. They were proud of what they had. They were proud of their culture and their language. And yes, they could speak Russian, but they had their own language and they were very proud of that. And they were proud that the Soviet Union didn't manage to take that away from them. They managed to cling on to it. So it was absolutely incredible living with them. Let me talk you through the photography because the photography for me was just incredible. Uh, for a start, I was there in winter. So in winter, you only have three, maybe four hours of daylight in a day. Uh, and it's this winter sun. And the beauty of that winter sun is that 
you can on on quite a few days you can have this sunrise this incredible golden hour which almost then blends into sunset so you can have this incredible light in those three hours um and quite often what you get as well is you get this lovely soft uh softbox kind of light and that's also lovely but the, you know there's no definition in anything but it was just incredible the light was amazing i'll just show you some of the images here yeah so you could see here you know this was probably taken about nearly three o'clock um in the afternoon maybe two o'clock in the afternoon and it's all the reindeer were close in and the sun was setting behind them and i just kind of i don't know what it was about this image i just kind of i just wanted to hint of reindeer some of the antlers and then this incredible sky behind them yeah the next day we moved on and that was amazing too you know to see the herd move there's like two thousand reindeer all following each other some of them are tied up and pulling the sledges but all the others are free um but because they're herd animals they all follow on and you can see here the sun it is incredible and this again this was a sunset image so this is probably about two in the afternoon and you can see where the sun is it's this incredible light and it almost stretches into a line through the clouds with the reindeer going off in the distance and that was incredible and then this image here i nearly dismissed this image when i first when I was looking through them, um, when I got back to the UK, there's just something about it. It was those lovely pink hues in the sky. And what I really like is the contrast. So you've got this lovely warm sky, but then the bottom of it, where the snow is, is still kind of blue and it gives it that cold feeling. And I love that almost juxtaposition between those two colors, between the blue and the, the warmth of the sky. Uh, it's lovely. So this was uh, Daria. Uh, she was only three years old, and yet she would help out all the time. And in particular, what, the, the one element that surprised me is when they they killed and butchered two reindeer whilst I was there. And those reindeer will last them a long time, so they don't kill reindeer very that that often. But they need the meat, and they use the fur, and they use literally everything. And Daria not only witnessed it but she would actually help you could see her helping trying to pull the fur off um and she's three years old and that's her life it was just incredible she was a very funny little girl she was very inquisitive she loved seeing the pictures um on the back of the camera when when we were in that warm environment inside the chum and she would point at her family members saying their name so that was incredible and i remember <laughs> two occasions with her where it kind of freaked me out and one of them was they just butchered this reindeer and uh, as they're butchering it they will eat the raw meat so they'll cut little strips off and eat the raw meat as they're butchering it properly and I turned around I didn't manage to get a shot of this but I turned around and there was Daria with a strip of meat about this long and she was dipping it into the carcass where the blood was like as if the blood was ketchup and then she would eat it <laughs> it was it was it wasn't sickening but it was just eye-opening to see this you know to see this way of life the other incredible thing you know taking this image of of daria here and you can see she's got this lovely uh hood around her and it comes right up to her mouth here and it's lovely and her arms sort of stick out like this with the gloves and i presume that's where her arms were so I took the picture and I'm sort of engaging with her afterwards. And then suddenly this hand came up like this and wiped her nose. And it, it freaked me out because I there I was. I saw her with her arms here. But then this other arm, I thought she had like a third arm. And it was like, oh my God, what is this? But what happens is they bring their arms in from the, the suit and they hold them inside to keep warm. But the, the arm of the suit just stays there as if as if their arms are in it. So that was kind of a funny moment as well. They were an incredible family and very, very tight family unit. And it was a real honor and privilege to be able to live alongside them uh, for the period that I did and to experience their way of life, their culture, and also to experience the challenges that they face, which are many, uh, then, but the two main ones really are climate change. That's really affecting them because the rivers are not freezing when they should. Uh, they're thawing 
uh, later and sometimes sooner. So it, it, it's just unpredictable for them. And when they're migrating during the winter, you know, they can't have that unpredictability because everything is set uh, as per the seasons. But when those seasons shift, it, it really affects them. And they've noticed a big change, you, you know, in the way the environment is behaving and, and they are having to adapt to adjust to that as well. One of the other things they face is the encroaching modernity. Um, companies coming in to exploit the resources in the Arctic as it as it becomes warmer. Gas companies building roads and railways across their lands where they where they've migrated and travelled for years where there's been nothing and and that is an area of conflict that they're coming in towards and because of that they've noticed things like uh, all the wolves. Uh, that were around have disappeared so all the wolves have gone because of the noise of the railways and and all these vehicles moving around and it's a real shame that this natural habitat is being treated and destroyed in such a way and that those people who live there guardians of that habitat as you were um, are, are being forced to either go to a city and settle or or forced to rethink their whole way of life and their culture and I think that is really very very wrong it was a trip of a lifetime it it was incredible and do you know what if you're planning a expedition like this a photographic expedition if it's just you and an interpreter and it's to a very remote extreme uh place then then do you know what go for it absolutely go for it because the benefits of it are incredible the experience that you gain the confidence you get the broadening your horizons of what's out there and how people live it's it's just fantastic and i think everybody should experience it in some way or another okay and that's it thanks for watching i hope i haven't waffled on too much don't forget to subscribe that would be amazing like this video and please comment below let me know what you think of the trip or the images uh, ask any questions about how you go about planning this you know anything uh, just let me know and I'll try and answer so until next time I'll see you later